Welcome to Rick's Corner. I have a friend of mine, Vinny Ciceri, back, who's got a long history in bodybuilding, martial arts, acting, stand-up comedy, film, TV, you name it, he's done it all, and he's still doing it, and he's doing a great job at it. And he's an interesting man, and he's my good friend, and I respect him, and I don't want to mess with him. <laughs> so that would have really hurt me. And I'm very old and fragile these days. So I wanted to talk about a few things. We have something coming up called Dragon Fest, which is a martial arts show. It's uh, once a year, and it's in, what city is it in? It's going to be Burbank Marriott, oh, Burbank, Cali Burbank, California. And it's, it's got a lot of demonstrations, a lot of booths, a lot of celebrities. We're going to go over that towards the end of the show. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to start with something, because Vinny is old school, and he likes old school bodybuilding. And we did a walkthrough on Easter in Venice one day, and I showed him all the points of interest, right? Sure. 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 That was fun, right? A, re a retelling. Yeah. And something I always dreamed of doing, but we, it was a, a childhood dream of mine to walk in the steps of what Rick and Arnold and uh, Lou and guys like that were doing every day. So Rick made that come true in a video that we did a day on Venice Beach. Well, so. what I did is I left breadcrumbs about three years ago, and they were still there, so we followed the steps all the way in. But since then, I've acquired some things. Um, people send me stuff of, of the old school bodybuilding, like the, the equipment, some of the equipment I have access to. Uh, and it's really nostalgic, so we're going to share this with you. First of all, the bench press, if you'll see in this picture, is the same machine or same bench that we used back in the 70s to do our benches on. There's a picture of Arnold spotting me on the bench. And what's different about that, that particular bench, Joe Gold, by the way, Joe Gold made everything. He had a machine shop in the back of the gym that the size of a postage stamp, and then he moved it to his <laughs> home. It's very small. And he made everything. And he and Dan Howard, who was a bodybuilder at the time, welded it, put it together, measured it, gave it to us. We liked it. We changed it. He did whatever we needed to have to, to make our benefit from it. So the bench press, which you see, is the same bench press we trained on back in the day. And that's Arnold spotted me on it, and it's uh, got the narrow stands behind the shoulders. And I was telling Vinny the reason that was narrow is because when you would bench, your shoulders would push against the bar, and it give you stability to push up. Today, for safety reasons, they moved them way out so the bar wouldn't tip. Yeah, it's true. So when you push off on that, you got to be careful. You might push yourself right off the end of the bench. It's true. 100%. Bench presses back in those days, a lot of guys cheated and they, their stomachs would be on the ceiling. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and they'd arch so bad, their yeah. stomachs would be up on the ceiling. Yeah. But we never did it. We always had the two second pause and did it right. Okay, then we have, there's a Roman chair. If you'll see, it's very barbaric looking. It's primitive looking. It's a seat. We have it elevated sitting on top of a box where your feet go and you rock and you do sit-ups there. Zeba Kazuski, one of Joe Gold's best friends, had the best abs in the world at the time, would do a thousand sit-ups, a thousand reps on this thing. Arnold would do them, everybody would do them. And this is another piece of history that you don't see around in the gyms today. It's really old school. Hard to tube steel, heavy duty, yeah, heavy well duty, made, well made piece of equipment. Yeah. And Joe Weld did this all by himself and uh, carry it into the gym and carry it out on his pickup. Later in the years he had a really bad back. He had several back surgeries, um, then ended up in a wheelchair. Yeah. Not from lifting, from all the heavy lifting with the, the machines and all the welding. I mean, just tore them up. Uh, then you'll see these dumbbells, and I've mentioned these dumbbells before on the show. Dumbbells today, they have the rubber, black rubber ones down in gold. Sure. You've seen those, they don't make sure. any noise. They, but they have small handles. Yeah. And I have big hands, and small handles to me just don't feel stable. But Joe knew this back when he made the dumbbells. The one on the right is the small handle. That's the first one he ever came up with. The middle one and the, the other one on the left are the handles he finally developed and used. And then they're bigger and they have the rings around them, as you can see. Much more comfortable. They're not only that, they, well, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're much more comfortable. Right? When you grab them, they felt like they were part of your arm. Sure. So they wouldn't feel lit flimsy and you could get a good crew, get good anything with those dumbbells. I don't know why they don't do these today. They're, they're an amazing thing. Well, our digits work in, a, in independent movement, so it doesn't, right. it makes a lot of sense why yeah. it wouldn't be one steel piece of bar. Like typing. Sure. You know, everything's independent. Yeah. Um, the th the thing I would like to do at some point in my life, maybe make a grip that would snap on, <laughs> that you could carry with you into the gym, snap it on, and have the same feel as those grips that Joe had. Sure. I've seen rubber grips, but they're not the same. Okay, then these handles, they look pretty much like handles today, or some of them. Joe actually made those out of steel. He actually cut them and made them and put them together uh, for the cable crossover machines, and they were perfectly made, designed for your hand. And like you said, they look like stirrups. I think that's what I think. He went to a western shop and yeah. stole a pair of stirrups. Yeah, it? that's what it looks like. But they worked, and they rotated nicely, and they had a good feel to them. Joe would make anything. Then you have these silver plates. These fit inside the pulling machines, and they're mm -hmm. slotted. You can see the slot in the plate, so that he could take them out without taking the whole machine apart and taking all the plates and all the bolts out if one broke or what. You know, because sometimes you let those things go and they crack in half. Sure. So sure. this is how he made it so you could interchange them. 
Brilliant. Um, these are just some of the pieces. There's more coming. I have friends all over the world that seem to have bits and pieces of his stuff. And I wanted to share this with you because it is a piece of history. I wish we had a history museum where we could put it all, and maybe someday we will. But um, many people have asked me, why don't you turn Gold's Gym into a museum, the original? Sure. Well, you can't. It's now a house, and it's owned by other people. Sure. And it's a modern house inside, and the outside is still the same. But here's my feelings, and tell me if I'm wrong. A historical bodybuilding museum would never make any money because people would no. come and see it, a few here and there, but it wouldn't even support its own rent. No. Right? No. I, I, I don't believe so. I, I, I mean, we, if you followed even the model of martial arts, because yeah. not even traditional martial arts will survive anymore. Yeah. Everything is just one word, MMA, so it's the same thing there. You know, it's, yeah. it's something about the history that nobody wants to, you know, only scholars that seem to study true history. They yeah. really want to know their past. Well, I'm very lucky that I still have a memory. <laughs> because a lot of guys are gone, a lot of guys don't want to talk about it. So I try to get some top name bodybuilders on here, as you guys know, to discuss this, and they don't even want to come out of the house. They're just acting old. And it's sad because there's a lot of history going on here. I watched Pumping Iron the other night for many times over. I was there when they filmed it, and I remember those days very well. I hung with the guys, but I was also wrestling at night, and I wasn't competing in the Olympia, so that's why I wasn't in Pumping Iron. Otherwise, it would have been. Um, actually, Arnold called me and said, Hey, we're filming tonight. Come bring your guitar over. And I said, I can't. I'm working at the Olympic Auditorium. So. Otherwise, I would have had a little piece in that memorable thing. But looking at Pumping Iron, I know you've seen it. Yes. Many oh, my times. God. It's, Many it's like living. I want my kids to watch it. It's like, here's where we were in the past. That's what it was exactly like that down at the beach and the sure. gym. Venice wasn't crowded. We laid on the lawn. We laid on the sand. We just talked. And if anybody wants to know what, what life was like back then, that's perfect dis description of what it was. Sure. Good old days, right? Sure. Calm. And everybody knew each other. I mean, you, you really all, everybody really knew who, who, who you were. There was yeah. no strangers, you know, you no. were a group. You Camaraderie. Were Camaraderie, and we've said this over and over, and I know you guys like these stories, and there's many to come, but uh, I'm going to see how much of this equipment I can get pictures of and, and post and see what I can do with it all. Uh, I have, I've mentioned this before, I have the original table saw that Joe Gold used to build this equipment, all the wood for the benches, and it's sitting out in my carport. He gave it to me in 1982. He said he didn't need it anymore. It's made by Sears. And it's sitting out there rusty. I had an accident with it, but I still kept it. I'm going to talk about what the accident is. When I, when the first time I did your show was like in 2010, I think, and we talked about uh, how where I started training, and I had said I started training on a makeshift solar flex uh, yes. uh, 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 machine. And my my cousin Tony was just like had the mind like Joe. He refused to buy anything that somebody else made. He just stole. He took the schematic from the solar flex, went and got the tube steel, and yeah. it's made out of almost that old same tube steel that yeah. you're showing these original pieces. Yeah, that's what it looked like. It was this piece of pre-Christian war horse, you know, yeah. uh, uh, workout, but it. It totally was uh, uh, the best piece of equipment you could work out on. Like you, you, you could never, you couldn't break it, you couldn't wear it out, you couldn't. It was always there, always ready. One solid piece of equipment. Yeah, even the the incline bench press, which I'm showing here too. That that's another one that Joe made. Um, if you can look at it closely, you'll see it has a pin to adjust the seat up and down and a pin to adjust the seat up and down here. It's not those little spring buttons where you can actually adjust it. It was right. really kind of primitive for what it was, but it did the job. Um, and it was a good bench. I mean, you could go any angle you wanted with it back in those days. So I just wanted to bring this up. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm going to give you guys a link in the description to the video we did when we did the walkthrough at Easter of all the outside stuff we did. And I want you to watch that. Now, on to subject part two. <laughs> We're going to talk about Dragon Fest and, and Vinny's history with martial arts. And, um, how'd that come about with you from bodybuilding? Well, um... I did the two bodybuilding shows back in 88 that we talked about, the mm -hmm. Mr. Florida and the Mr. Hollywood, and I did them both on the same day, and going through that experience, I found that it really wasn't for me, and I had just ventured into the martial arts, because I had owned a nightclub, and the guy got stabbed, and I started learning how to take away a knife, mm -hmm. but the martial arts fit the bodybuilding. I love the aspects of bodybuilding and, 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 and working every muscle that we can to the best we can, but to compete, to have somebody say, you're the best, or to pat you on the back and give you a little medal or something like that, I never needed that. Mm -hmm. For me, it, mm -hmm. just, it wasn't for me to go through the dieting and that. Um, I think that what we do now is a way of life rather than when people say, oh, you're dieting or you're trimming up or you're shredding up. No, yeah. this is a way of life yeah. for us. We're almost always, in my opinion, in striking distance of like 10 or you know 12% body fat. We're well, always... Yeah, I could do that if I hadn't had ice cream this week three times. <laughs> and 
I actually had a milkshake, which I haven't had in 20 years. So. And then I started, I said, I know their abs are there. I can feel them and I can see them when I cough, but they're a little covered with a little layer. But you know what? I'm I can see you put a little weight on since the last time I saw you, but you're loud. You came out of the hospital. Why do I look fat in my jeans? No, you got, but you can see your face is fuller. <laughs> Tell my butt look fat in the jeans. <laughs> but you look, you look fuller, and you look, you look more healthy, and you, and 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 because, and I think because of your knee, your knee surgery, you know, you had to I can squat again down a little bit, yeah, I can squat again, yeah. Well, bodybuilding is a way of life, and you've been training for years and years and years and years and years, and you, mm -hmm. and you look great, and you do watch your diet. Yes, there are cheat days. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, Monday to Friday, stay clean. Yeah. Saturday and Sunday, go off the reservation. I think Monday to Friday is the cheat day, and Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish it could be. Um, I, but I think we're predestined to, to, to being fat because we have the Italian gene in us. And my my father was over three hundred. My you know everybody in my family is over three hundred pounds. So it's 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 really easy to follow that model. And I think for Italians, and the biggest thing is to give a, give up the bread, to give up the bread and the pastas and the sauce. Come on, it's I mean you're killing hard. me. You're killing me. To give that up, no yeah. question about it. That's the first thing I do. What kind of bread do you have? You have a sourdough with butter. I'm eating it. <laughs> now, you're the martial arts. You've done quite well. With that you've been all over doing this stuff. Yes. Sir. Let's hear about it a little bit. Uh, so, um, I have my first fourth degree black belt under Dr. Moses Powell, who was creator of Sanukas Jiu Jitsu, who was uh, under Master V. Florenda Visitation he was one of the very first organizers of, of, of Jiu Jitsu in America. And um, my mine is an East Coast history, but not a sport. History. I have nothing to do with sports, as you know. It's all combat mm -hmm. or, or or military, law enforcement, non-compliant, subject-oriented movement, mm -hmm. um, which leads way to um, a different set of mind principles, a different way of thinking. Um, where guys, you know, how guys horse around in the gym and they'll call each other names and joke around. Yeah, our guy, guys around uh, don't do that. They don't talk like that. They yeah. don't act like that no. because they have more respect for one another as a martial artist. Where I think the guys in the gym get away with calling each other names, you know, and it's it, all in fun. It's all in fun. But there's something different about the martial arts that that requires a respect level that must be there. Well, when you walk in the Dragon Fest, Dragon Fest, and there's a lot of people there. You don't call anybody names because you don't know who's who. <laughs> you don't know who's going to jump on you. It's just, and they won't. But everybody's pretty deadly in that in that place. They, they all have their own skills. The first time I heard about Dragon Fest, uh, I got here in 2001. I had gotten a free ticket from somebody that knew Cynthia Rothrock, as we, yeah. we just spoke about. She gave my VIP ticket. They gave it to me, and I went as a guest. And it was at the Glendale Auditorium, and it was when uh, yes. I remember it was uh, the very first day I walked in, and I met uh, Gene LaBelle that very mm -hmm. first day, and um, the, and Ed Parker's son, Ed Parker Jr., mm -hmm. and he was with uh, uh, Steve Muhammad, as we know, Stephen Saunders, <laughs> but Steve Muhammad, who was Wesley Snipes' guy. And, that was the, and then from there, meeting a bunch of guys, and then after that, on the way out, I literally looked in the camera because I filmed everybody. It was remember post 9 11, we were doing yes. all how to train all sky motions. I came out of it, I looked in the camera at Uncle Mike and I said, Next year we're going to headline this thing. And he thought it was out of my mind. And I think it's that kind of putting it out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? I mean, it, you had a lot of people there. I mean, that I can't believe that was 2002. Oh 2002. God. The picture of you and me and Gary, yes. where we're all sitting around, yes. and has the long hair. Yep. That's 2002 Dragon Fest, our performance. Well, that time went. Yeah. So this year, it's what's the date? This is August 5th. Okay. Which is Saturday. It's uh, was that three weeks away from now? It's going to be bright, but I'll try to find yeah. and scan this in. And um, I tell you, I have never ever been on. The poster of Dragon Fest with any of these great people. Everybody on there is, to me, has my respect. This is all the stars. Admiration. This is all the stars going to be on there, and if any's right there at the top of the list, so yeah. that's quite a place to be. Yeah, that's really. I'm very proud of you that you come to that level. But everybody loves you. That's what it is. <laughs> and um, and we have Colonel Friend coming, who is the oldest living red-tailed Tuskegee Airman pilot still alive in California. He's 97 years old, and he'll be there. And he's a very dear friend of ours. And he's actually won the Congressional Medal of Honor. He's a he's a, a he's a he's a he's a uh, an American hero. Well, you also have Joe Montagna. Yes, who's uh, uh, from Criminal Minds. Very dear friend, Michael Jai White. Um, Spawn, yeah, yeah, Spawn. Uh, uh, movies. Uh, Don the Dragon Wilson for sure. Yeah, uh, He's always there. Benny, uh, Benny the Jet, Arquitas. Benny introduced me in 2002 to Michael Matsuda and was the one that actually got me up on stage and got me my first gig. I see Benny and his wife every Sunday at five o'clock. You do. You know why? We go to church. No, we go to the movies. <laughs> yeah, my girl and I, we see him every week, and we all got our popcorn and go, "What are you watching? Oh, that. We're gonna go see this without fail every Sunday." With Eagle Woman. 
<laughs> With Eagle Woman. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So then you got James Liu, who's a wonderful guy. Yeah. And Art Camacho, who's a stunt coordinator. Unbelievable. And then Sasha Mitchell, who's a very good friend of mine and yours as well. Yes. He's been on my show. And Philip Ree. Oh, Philip Ree, I haven't seen in years. Philip and I sparred together for a couple of years. You know what the original Karate Kid Dojo? Remember yeah, the original yeah, yeah. Cobra Kai in Lancashire? Yeah. When I tell people that was the original Cobra Kai Dojo, they're going to get out of here. That's oh, North Hollywood. Philip's such a good guy. I haven't seen him in so long. Guy. Tremendous um, guy. Tremendous. Tremendous martial arts. Who else do we have here? That's well, right. this is Herbert Jefferson, who okay. was in Battlestar Galactica, okay. right? And then you have Albert Long, who is, you, if you remember him, the famous scene where Mel Gibson, he's electrocuting him in, yes. um, in, in, in a lethal, lethal weapon, weapon, and he right. says, I'm going to kill all you guys. Yeah, yeah. That's when Mel goes off and comes out of You've it. You've got a lot of people here. In it. it is literally the greatest lineup of martial arts and celebrities. Uh, Master Kubota. Uh, who made the original Kubaton, Eric Lee, the King of Kata, who's been in uh, Big Trouble Little China, a hundred other movies. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, Leo Fong, uh, Gerald Okuyama, Gerald, who who really used to run Dragon Fest. He was the face of it. He was the face of it. Yeah. It was really his son-in-law that ran the whole thing. Oh, this is great. August 5th, 2017. Uh, it's at the uh, Burbank... Burbank Marriott, Marriott, right across the street from the uh, Burbank Airport. And it starts at what time? It starts at 11 and goes to 6 and uh, come and see our booth. And this year, what, what I'm really proud about is, look, our, our goal here is to get the, the Martial Arts History Museum. It's the only museum of its kind and it is here in Burbank. It's a small facility and they live off of donations and people trying to keep the, the history of martial arts alive. Yeah. A lot of people really don't care about that. They care all the money is in MMA or this or that or whatever. But the truth of the matter is without the people here, without these people cutting their teeth and going through what they do, we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be a martial arts museum. There wouldn't be martial arts. There wouldn't be anything without right. these guys. Yeah. So, you know, respect is mandatory and must be paid to them. Yeah, these guys put it on the map. Let's talk about your weapon. Okay. Um, okay. Many many martial artists have a, a synthesis of what they think is the best kind of tool or weapon for them to use. In my experience, dealing with non-compliant subjects and dealing with um, active, active, critical, ever-changing environment situation, this is one of the best things I've ever used outside of my brain, obviously, and your talent. Any weapon, as you know, like any piece of equipment, is only as good as the artist that's wielding it. Exactly. It doesn't matter. If, I can give you the greatest piece of equipment, but if you don't know what you're doing with it, somebody will take it away from you. You could use a credit card if you know how to do it. Indeed. Right. Indeed. So what this is, is Master Kubota put one out years ago. He says on his book, it says that he did not take his from the from the Uwara, which is the original samurai weapon that stayed in their belt, which was for nerve striking and pressure points, after the katana wagasashi had already been used. Mm -hmm. This particular thing I designed after 9-11 for flight attendants because they all carried a mag light and they needed to get their stages down from one, two, three moves. You can't have for four, five, six moves. Nobody does that in the real world. It will never happen. That's no. only in a dojo. Right. But in the real world, one, two, three moves. So if you can make them say, okay, put this here and there's your mag light. Go one. Reach your mag light. They already have the weapon in hand. They've deployed their weapon. Now you already got them to one and they're armed. Right. Not teach them two and three. It's just two more moves. Okay. Instead of trying to make it too complicated. Yeah. And the second thing is I think that a lot of martial artists know pressure points on the body to a certain extent but haven't went deep enough into it to understand exactly cause and effect of what they're doing and when, when you do have a reflex arc. So the same thing here like with these with the grooves we just talked about them with the with the uh, Joe's Hold weapons. So we can see it. Okay if you look at the grooves on these when you see this thing it has my symbol which is very difficult to see here which is American Old School Jiu Jitsu which is this symbol here okay and then on the top made in USA now I've went through several people that have tried to get involved with me with this and everybody tried to give me money to get this done through China and I'm adamantly against it. Let me explain something very clearly. I am 1000% US back born bred American New York Bronx boy. It, yeah. if it, I am behind the US military all the way, all branches, period. End of discussion. And um, this, this is a knockout. So this goes in your hand, this strikes you underneath the chin and a pressure point right there. It's for, it's for dazing somebody, give them one strike, boom, they clap their teeth together, it makes them go away. Yeah. If you have something else that's in your hand, it has a two inch pivoting key ring. Why? So that the, the metal keys can just slash against the face, 
just to back somebody off of you to get them away from Makes you sense. with one splash, okay? Yeah. It's a deterrent. It's not going to make you Karate Joe. What it is going to do is stop the possibility of you being aggressed in this first movement. Now, let's say that they do get to you. You have a pointed end here that strikes nerve strikes, but it can also go through down because we're not all going to be in Southern California. And I grew up doing in Miami and New York. Guys were just in a pair of shorts. Well, what are you going to do if a guy's got a down jacket on and you're trying to do pressure point strikes? Yeah. You can't get through it. That's what this does. The grooves are so if your hands are wet, you got oil, you're on the beach or something, nobody can disarm it. it goes, mm -hmm. Once it goes in your hand, yeah. you can see nobody yeah. can take that out of your hand. I don't yeah. care who it is. The, the keychain is strong enough nickel plated that it won't, it won't bend or flex under duress. Polyjection and co uh, uh, polyjection uh, and, uh, uh, what do you call it? injected mold. So it's virtually indestructible. If somebody picks it up, if you lose it, somebody picks it up, they think it's a cool thing, but they really don't know what to do with it because unlike a knife, everybody knows how to stab something with a knife. As soon as they see this, they go, oh, you can stab a guy. Well, stabbing a guy is the least amount of thing that you can do with this thing. Yeah. For controlling, for law enforcement, when we're dealing with a non-compliant subject, we have something called a finger technique or kubitori technique, which is as far as I have ever seen, and I'm doing this almost 30 years, I've never seen anybody under more com more compliant than a guy who has, has been in a finger lock. Period. I don't care who big or how big they are because of the way the human body's made. Right. So from their, from their things that we do where we have our come alongs here right to our to our things here where we do our finger locks where these just go over and we put oh, this finger yeah, lock yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just this simple and it doesn't require size or strength and right. with the turn of a hand this way knowing how the human body works we always work the small dials you know remember Wally J was really magnificent about that remember Wally J yeah, Master, yeah, J. Master yeah, yeah. Wally J you had something called small circle jiu-jitsu not the big circles when Steven Seagal came it was more Aikido big circles Aikido jitsu big circular movement but the guy's six foot six mm -hmm. Wally J is a smaller guy like Master V mm -hmm. so he realized no I have to make things smaller so I follow more of Wally J and Master V presence which is make things smaller go to the smallest thing and if you know the smallest thing to its basic element then you must know the whole makes sense to me so turn the small dial which turns the big dial why yeah. fight the pec and the arm and the, and the bicep and the bicep brachii and the flexors and abductors when all I have to do is turn your you, you have something called your digitorium right which is your muscularity in your digits right if I lock that down and make a circular motion with that it turns your whole body because your body is now leveraged against itself you know where I saw you do this at Dragon Fest yeah three guys <laughs> Darren, Mc, Darren McBee from, from the gladiators yes remember yes he got big his, guy he, yeah he, he got his thumb and he was like crying and you were leading him around and two guys behind him were trying to get you and all you did was lead him into the guys and they were all falling down what? that was so much fun I, I tell you I just when these are going to be debuted for Dragon Fest for August 5th I'm going to do a whole arrest and control seminar with it and again for this year Dragon Fest in, since its inception with I don't remember the year it started but I do remember that coming up now to 2017, they've never ever had a, a military presence ever at one of their events. This year, we got the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, U.S. Coast Guard, and American Legion Outpost 43, which is Cary Grant and the famous one on Hollywood and Highland where the cannon is. Oh, yeah. We got that post there to show an enormous presence with 10 recruiters from each one of them. We, we, I always say we, me and my team, facilitated that for Dragon Fest because our out game here is to get them a big museum, a big beautiful martial arts museum like you just talked about for bodybuilding, yeah, yeah, yeah. but for martial arts. But the guys with the big names in martial arts really don't care about this thing because if they did, they could easily have a fundraiser, do a free sale. A guy yeah. like Chuck Norris could come along tomorrow, do a seminar, and they'd have all the money in the world for their new thing. A guy like Chagall could do the same thing. Guys that have that kind of power, star power, could actually do it. But they're already made. They don't, they don't need to care anymore. These are, these are going to be for tomorrow. What about guys. the Martial Arts Museum on Magnolia? That's what this is. Okay. That's, what, that's why I brought you the other pamphlet, too, because Michael Matsuda, who's a curator of it, who yeah. used to have the magazine Inside Kung Fu, who made uh, Bill Sugar for Cunningham and so many other guys prominent, um, Michael is the guy that I work with on this so much. And like I said to him, last year I visited Dragon Fest, brought a crew with me, and I saw that they had gotten it together. And what I didn't like about Dragon Fest years ago is that it turned into a swap meet yes. rather than a martial arts conference. A weightlifter or a bodybuilder appreciates true original knowledge 
if it's not the guy who originally did it, at least you're learning from a first generation guy and yeah. you're getting real knowledge. Yeah. When they all of a sudden bring you a display selling you something you and I both know to be placebo-ish in nature and effect, but they want to sell it, that to me becomes you excuse my language, no other terminology for it, you're whoring out our something that we live. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't believe that that's appropriate. This is what happened. I want to make this real short because this is a whole other story. The Cauliflower Alley Club was started you know, many, many years ago by an actor by the name of Mike Mazurki. Sure. And he was an actor. He was also a wrestler back in the 50s. And it was a group of guys that meet at the Spaghetti Factory for lunch, and they called it the Cauliflower Alley Club because he had a cauliflower ear. Mm -hmm. Now they had 20, 30 members, and they would all get together for lunch, and they decided to expand to get more wrestlers in and make more money and put money into it, get more money for the funding. And then they expanded even more into boxers. Then it was boxers and wrestlers. Then it got bigger and became actors. Mm -hmm. Then it became other people. And now today, the cauliflower alley comes big, but it's just people off the street that can come and go. It's lost its meaning of what it really was to me. Sure, it's not the same thing it was. Sure, but it's still I, there. And I, I see the same thing in goals. Yeah, I never seen so many. I commented on your thing when you said, "Here's the old school guys were yeah. sweating, and then the new schools, everybody's got a camera." Yeah, sitting on the thing doing a deal. Yeah, I, I, I just <clears throat> it completely takes your breath away. Well, we covered a couple of subjects here, old school bodybuilding with the equipment and Dragon Fest and martial arts, and it's always good to have you here. You have a lot of knowledge and you present it properly, and I love your commercials about cutting the cheese. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's so funny. Thank you. And our show, Call Vinny, is coming back out on the Outdoor Channel. That's uh, the thing. We started to talk about it last time I had just shot the pilot, Yeah. but I didn't get a chance to, to go into it because we didn't have our slots yet. Yeah. But now the Vice President of Network has become the President, and our show is back on to be put on to Network. So what I'm going to be doing is showing the pilot at Dragon Fest mm -hmm. and then um, again come to our booth anybody just come by you'll see the a lot of stuff that we did through the years a lot of history at the booth this our booth will be about the history of bodybuilding martial arts and our, our evolution in it perfect thank you so much mate brother <laughs> I really appreciate you coming here He's thank you a great guy and, I'm, and we don't get together often enough but at least we did today thank you so much thank you for having me guys for watching Rick's Corner and this has been very enlightening and fun. I love having him and I'll see you guys next time. Okay, see you. Baby. See, See you next time. time.